Okay, I know people are still gathering, but we have some housekeeping matters to get through, so we'll we'll get started here. I want to thank you all again for joining us uh, for today's webinar. This webinar is focused on the M&A outlook for the, the second half of 2022 and beyond. Um, we're excited to get to it. We have a great panel for you today, some familiar faces, some new. Um, for those of you I have not yet had the opportunity to meet, my name is Lena Dobrier. I'm the Director of Operations at Opus Connect. We're a lower middle and middle M&A focused organization. We're membership based. We've been around 12 years now, which is crazy. Uh, I've been here a little over five and we're doing a number of events. Uh, 350, I believe, is the number per year. A bunch of different formats, webinars like you're joining today. Uh, Deal Connect events where we pair up investment makers and private equity firms, which I'm sure many of you are attending this afternoon. So a lot going on. If you're interested in learning more about what we do and how we can help support your business development needs, please reach out to my colleague Swayze or anyone on the Opus team for that matter. Uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, Today's webinar. So you all as audience members will be able to participate via written Q&A. So as questions come to mind, feel free to submit your uh, questions in the Q&A bubble at the bottom of your screen. We'll be monitoring those and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Don't be shy. Um, let's see. So I want to give our sponsors, we have two today, one of which is a moderator. Is Curtis Sear in the room? I believe he is. Uh, Curtis, I'm going to go ahead and um, unmute you. Please uh, introduce yourself and your firm. Hi, everybody. Curtis here from WP Gazelle. Um, so we have, I've been in the startup game for a while, <clears throat> started several companies um, throughout that. Um, it's become pretty apparent, uh, just in my experience, that uh, a company's website is one of the highest points of leverage to increase sales. So uh, what, what I'm uh, doing now, the company currently that I have is WP Gazelle. Uh, we focus on um, increasing sales on e-commerce B2P websites uh, from a data-driven approach. So looking at the analytics, looking at uh, using AI, those kinds of things to optimize the, the sales funnel on websites for, for higher end websites. So what I'll talk about today is uh, just uh, some metrics and things that, that are publicly available you guys can look at to gauge how your personal websites are doing, um, as well as those in your portfolio. So hopefully it'll be a value to you guys and looking forward to chatting later. Awesome. Thank you so much, Curtis. Uh, thank you for being here and thank you for your support. Uh, Plant Moran, of course, is our other sponsor. Ted Morgan of Plant Moran is going to be uh, moderating today's uh, webinar. So we want to give him a quick shout out here, but Ted will kind of get into more about what they do and, and his role at the firm once we start the webinar, which is in just a moment. First, uh, we have a uh, poll question, and, and unfortunately, this, this slide is mislabeled, so apologies, but we are going to launch the first question, and the only question actually, which is, which best describes you? This is going to give us and our panel members a good idea of who's in the audience who, so they know who they're speaking to. So please take a few moments and go ahead and submit uh, your response, independent sponsor, capital provider, investment banker, uh, service provider, or other. Let us know. We'll give it five or 10 seconds here and then we'll move on. Okay, so 18% independent sponsor, 24% uh, investment banker, 18% on the debt side of providing capital, 12% on the equity side, and 29% service provider. Thank you all for participating in that. We appreciate that. And uh, without further ado, we're going to introduce uh, Ted Morgan of Plant Moran, Plant Moran has been a, a longtime sponsor now, if I can say, or, or just more recently over the last couple of years, uh, they've been really participating in a lot of events and we appreciate the support. Ted comes with, with the knowledge, uh, a, a wealth of knowledge, 20, over 20 years experience in this. So I'll kick it over to Ted and uh, thank you, Ted, for leading today's webinar. Thank you, Lena. And uh, good morning, good afternoon uh, to all uh, on the phone here. Hello, esteemed panelists. Good to see you all again. Um, 
yeah, I'll kind of roll out today's panel. You know, I, I would just say I'll introduce myself here in a second, but um, you know, we we talked about kind of how there's so many things in the headlines that are not great right now from a macro level. <laughs> uh, depending on you want financial, you want geopolitical, you kind of got to poke for either. Um, and so that's all uh, real things that are happening and some real some real challenges. But I think we try to kind of come down to, to earth, if you will, from a standpoint of good old, you know, middle market M&A, which is why we're all here. And I think we all felt like the first half was pretty active and lots of capital, lots of deals. And um, while certainly some challenges within the portfolios with inflation that are probably, you know, some of the macro issues clo hitting close to how we said, let's just try to not get to overthink this. And let's just kind of, you know, really kind of focus on what do we think that the next six months are going to uh, bring? And then we will go a little further out from there. That will be a little more strategic, but again, knowing that there is just a lot, a lot of noise there in in the, the broader world in in the matter of speaking, I think we all kind of came as panel feeling pretty good about where things are in our respective years. So we'll kind of dig into that. So that's really kind of why we're here. Um, I'll introduce myself a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm a partner at Plant Moran in our strategy and operations uh, consulting practice at Plant Moran. Joined the firm about ten years ago um, after spending most of my career in industry in the industrial manufacturing segments. A uh, fair amount of auto, plastics, uh, metal formers, uh, kind of a good old uh, I'm a Midwest guy. So um, that's kind of where my, my roots have been. Uh, client work now is really market, you know, market analysis, commercial due diligence, strategic planning, those types of, of things. And a little bit on the firm, uh, we're almost coming, we're coming up on our 100 year anniversary, which we're very excited about, founded in 1924. Uh, so really the first kind of 50 years of, of our business, we were a traditional audit and tax shop. In the last 48, it's definitely morphed to much more of a, a full service business advisory firm. So we kind of audit, tax, consulting, which I'm part of, uh, wealth management, where we manage about 20 billion in personal wealth for our clients with a, across about 175 uh, advisors. And then we have some of our affiliates with, within our group, uh, one of which being uh, my colleague here, Alan Clark from, from PMCF, which will explain uh, our investment banking affiliate uh, PMCF here in a moment. Um, so you can kind of see the broadth of what we do I think um, from a private equity perspective, I get the little dots on the map. We're about 25 offices, 3,700 folks, mostly Midwest and Rocky Mountain region. We're also in Mexico, China, India, and Japan. And then just for lastly, on the, our private equity practice, it's been a really, really fun ride over the last 10 years. We, we've grown up to, from about 50 clients 10 years ago to about, about 650 is what we're up to today. Um, and so it's been a, a good ride in the context of kind of bringing value service and advisory throughout really the life cycle of our investment of our investing clients. Um, and so we'll pour with all those services, but we do have a, a pretty comprehensive service solution approach within our 650 person consulting practice um, around strategy and operations, due diligence, IT advisory, um, and the like. So um, with that, I will turn over the uh, the mic, if you will, to uh, our, our esteemed panelists. And again, thanks, thanks to all of them for coming. I know them all quite well and I'm excited to kind of get in today. So, Carrie, would you would you take the baton and tell us about Hamilton Robinson and yourself? Good morning, everyone. Carrie Deloro, Director of Operations at Hamilton Robinson Capital Partners. I actually came to the private equity world in a little bit of a roundabout motion. Uh, I actually started in the textile world with boots on the ground for about 15 years in manufacturing facilities all over the world. Um, and then came back here to, uh, to Hamilton Robinson where we focus solely in the industrial sector. Um, so any kind of a good B2B industrial service or good old fashioned US manufacturing. Um, we sit in Stamford, Connecticut. Uh, and I would say we sit mainly in the lower middle market. So companies that are about three to 10 of EBITDA, say 25 to 75 uh, top line of revenue. Um, we are, typically first institutional capital. So really enjoy working with the original entrepreneurs or family run businesses. Um, do do a couple of divestitures, but, but mainly we like to be, um, we like to really get in there on the bottom, on the bottom rung and uh, help these small businesses to really grow and thrive in, uh, in the environment here in the US. Thank you, Carrie. Let's go, Ellen. Hello, I'm Ellen Clark. I'm a managing director at PMCF and uh, I'm the lone investment banker on the panel. And it looks like uh, a good chunk of our, our uh, audience is investment banking. So 
hello to my colleagues out there. Um, I've been in investment banking for about 25 years. I spent the bulk of my career at Deloitte, uh, where I was leading one of the leaders of the industrials practice and part of the global automotive practice. Um, I spent most of my time doing carve outs and divestitures for multinational organizations around the world. Um, about a year ago, I joined PMCF. I co-lead the industrials practice. Um, and that practice includes industrial manufacturing, um, distribution, logistics, and um, uh, in automotive as well. Um, our practice, PMCF practice, is about 30 professionals. We're in Detroit, Chicago, and Denver. Um, in addition to industrials, we focus on business services, packaging, technology, um, and healthcare. Um, and um, we work mostly with founder-owned, family-owned businesses. Um, from my perspective, PMCF has been a tremendous fit just because um, you know, I, I appreciate the power of um, that an integrated firm can bring. And so being affiliated with Plant Moran um, has great advantages. And unlike Deloitte, um, both PMCF and Plant Moran focus on the middle market. So there's um, great symmetry between us and that just creates better opportunities for our clients. Great. Thank you, Ellen. Who have next? Justin. Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Justin Style, Managing Director at Middle Ground Capital. I am originally from Detroit, so it feels good to continue to travel out that way and, and invest in industrial businesses. I got my start in mergers and acquisitions at Merrill Lynch, and shortly uh, thereafter, I uh, joined Evercore, uh, which was a small firm at the time, um, and uh, stopping at Pinebridge, which was one of the largest LPs at, at Evercore. I've now made my way to Middle Ground, and this is my 19th year in private equity. Uh, Middle Ground is a relatively um, unique firm in the in the sense that two of its three founders were actually operations people before getting into private equity. And so two of the founders had long careers at Toyota. And that explains why our headquarters is in Lexington, Kentucky, which is still a stone's throw from what is Toyota's largest plant in the world in Georgetown, uh, Kentucky. I sit in our New York City office and our firm is split relatively evenly between members of the investment team and members of our operations team. Uh, and, and we continue to pull from that Toyota ecosystem and a large part of what we bring to the private equity world is a operational know-how and working collaboratively with our portfolio companies. Um, and it's good to be here. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Justin. Michael, take us home, buddy. Thank you, Ted. And, and thanks all the other panelists. It's been good to get to know you, you know, on our pre-calls here. Uh, Michael Fieldstone, one of the founders of Ethereum, we started a little bit over 12 years ago. So uh, summer of 2009 wasn't a very, uh, very easy time to raise capital. Um, so we start off as much more family office capital. That was fund one. And, and now we're on fund four. We manage about one and a half billion throughout all the funds. Our latest fund is about 800 million in size. Um, we focus on the small end, small end of the middle market as well. We're typically companies of 10 million in EBITDA to 50 million of EBITDA. I would say we have three legs to the stool to what we do. You know, one is the traditional like complex storied acquisitions. It could be turnarounds. It could be just, you know, bankruptcy. It could be carve out work. The, the other leg of the stool is uh, family founder which to tell you the last seven years, probably 80% of what we've done has been more family founder acquisitions uh, where you really have to collaborate with what and listen to what the family or founder wants out of the acquisition, both uh, out of closing and post-closing. And then the third leg of the stool is with the experience now a little over 12 years, even though we're industry agnostic, we have certain sectors that we focus more heavily on and we've been more proactive at having buy and build strategies in certain sectors. Um, we own about 18 companies today, and we have about 25 people on the team, mainly a transaction team, but we have a, a few people on the operations team that will continue to grow and, and um, look forward to uh, getting to the panel. Great. And with that, Michael, let's, let's, just, let's jump in. So um, thanks for hanging with us, folks. We're going to probably jump into probably 25 minutes or so of, of discussion. So 
and we'll leave some time for Q&A. So uh, as Lena said, don't be shy. Feel free to hit the Q&A button and, and pop them away. Um, all right, so let's level set, right? You kind of heard my intro to the panel. Um, a, lot of, a lot of chaos and crazy things happening at a macro level. What does that mean to middle market? During our prep calls, we all kind of agreed that, okay, inflation, supply chain issues, uh, you know, the never ending war on human talent, like those are real issues that are affecting all of us and our businesses. So uh, kind of the level set, I'll kind of pass baton uh, here and just have each of the panels kind of talk a little bit about that um, around the issues kind of impacting them and their world as they've kind of seen, particularly what's happened in the last six months. So um, Carrie, let's start with you. So, I mean, I think for all of us down in, in the lower middle market, that the supply chain and the, the labor shortages have really been the two that have been most uh, highlighted for our portfolio companies. So we've got 10 companies across the U.S. and, um, you know, they face pretty heavy headwinds um, in, in both of those situations. And now you're going to throw the inflation on top of them. Um, but I'm, I'm actually going to flip it a little bit and say, you know, it, we all know these headwinds are coming and it may get worse before it gets better. Um, but we've really been trying to keep everyone in the mindset of there's opportunities here, guys. We need to keep looking mm -hmm. for those opportunities. Um, you know, and anybody writing a SIM or reading a SIM, the, the key words I would say at this point are, are flexibility, adaptation, and resiliency. You know, anytime you put that in the stem, even if we've gotten 10 that week, that will probably move it to the top of the pile and get a little bit more attention. But I really think they're, they're valid points. Um, you know, how can we, as a group, help these smaller companies across the U.S. really weather things that we've never seen before? I mean, we have some CEOs that have been around 30, 40 years that are super accomplished professionals. And they're, you know, they're, they're looking for, for outside help saying, I've never seen the situations that, um, that are being presented to us today. And not just from a single source, but like we said, from, from many different directions. No, thanks, Carrie. And we'll kind of jump in um, in a couple more questions on round some, we'll kind of unpeel that a run or two below. So thanks, Carrie, for that. Um, Justin, let's go to you. Sure. So I the the issues that you mentioned and in interest rates, inflation, labor, I, I think uh, some of those issues are impacting some companies and other companies are being impacted by all of them. It's sort of a, a, a mixed bag. Uh, but I would say that there, there are real advantages to being part of a portfolio at this time because we can see how we're getting price increases in some areas and try to leverage those in others. There's also a little bit of competitive pressure with our management teams. This management team was able to get this kind of price right. increase. You know, what, what can you accomplish? Uh, but in all seriousness, we also try to leverage um, our own experience across the portfolio with, with procuring commodities and inputs to production. Uh, and, and I know we'll get into this a little bit later, uh, but Middle Ground has launched an automation unit that is sort of a sister company where we're helping accelerate and advance automation opportunities inside the plant, you know, a long time ago uh, to bring labor efficiencies into a plant might be an opportunity in private equity to reduce headcount. In today's environment, it's all about freeing up headcount to move to other places in the plant where it's highly valuable in such a tight labor market. Great. Thanks, Justin. Let me, um, Mike, let's go over you. And, and you know, Tyrion's um, definitely has its fair share of industrials uh, within the portfolio. Um, maybe if you can comment on the, but you also have business services in there. So like maybe make a comment as it relates to some of the business services as, you know, side of the business within the Tyrion. Sure, sure. Thanks for that, Ted. Look, I mean, it, it's, um, I, I think uh, I've been taking notes from Carrie because we're going to be launching some exits in, in the next uh, six months. We'll see how they do, but flexibility, adaptation, resiliency is something that, that we're definitely going to look to bring to bear. I think most important, at this time, the last couple of years with all the COVID effect, uh, inflation, uh, the you know, Ukrainian war, uh, DEI need to work on, ESG need to work on. I mean, there are just so many things hitting us all at the same time. And um, most important is that we have uh, the organization that can withstand that team. I mean, we, we can only help so much. We're active board members. We don't look to be CEOs, CFOs of companies. So you know, the, regardless of the industry, most important is what we find in this, in this day, you know, not only that you have that solid CEO that's front and center and takes that responsibility, but the CFO partnership 
and SIOP and purchasing partnership in a time where there's so much volatility on supply chain and price over cost decisions. Um, you know, I would say that's been our focus the last two years and beyond um, and what we're coming now. And business services in particular, we've, we've been thankful to be in that sector because of the labor shortage. A lot of the companies that we have that are in business services or like infrastructure services, um, there, there are only so many people you have in technical trade. I don't know if anyone has their own home project where they need a contractor, a plumber, or electrician, HVAC. We're, we're a lot in the commercial sector and on the residential sector, but I think it holds true that finding technical talent is very difficult. So we've had a, you know, supply chain issues have been a, a big issue, you know, getting the, you know, some of the supply needed to install certain equipment, you know, on, on some of the infrastructure services, but the actual inflation effect, you know, we found in that sector, you've been able to pass through that pricing and, you know, pass that on to the customer pricing because there's been a lack of supply of labor, right? So anyone kind of, you know, it'll be interesting with this more recent downturn, how that affects that sector, but, but, um, and we'll get into that, but, um, you know, it, it's a very tricky time. And, and, and I, I agree with, with Carrie, you know, the flexibility and nimbleness of the team is most important right now. Mm -hmm. Alan, take us home on this one, and then we'll jump into some more like deal activity discussion. But from the investment banker point of view, high level kind of thoughts on, again, some of the noise and chaos for six months, and then what does it look like the next six months? And mute. One, there's one every call. Goodness. All right, no, I had to be. I hate it when it's me. Oh, <laughs> it's <yeah>. usually me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so yeah, we, you know, th there is a lot of noise, but um, you know, our job is to kind of try to cut through that and and identify the opportunities. And you know, I think Michael said it very well. You know, it's it's identifying the strengths of the management team um, and playing really, really getting behind those and helping them to play up those strengths to the buyers. You know, we all know that there is a lot of cash still on the sidelines, um, both on the equity side and the debt side, as well as corporate, you know, there's a lot of corporate cash out there chasing transactions. And so, um, you know, it, it's not that there isn't a, a lack of supply. It's that you need to make sure that you're positioning the right asset in the right way. And also, um, you know, really thinking about who your buyer universe is and, and you know, those buyers that can bring something strategic to the table, um, you know, th those are going to be the best fit. And so really thinking about how your team um, that, you know, the, the company that you're selling and, and um, you know, the operations of that business can be kind of shown in the right kind of normalized light that will attract the right buyer and, and drive value. Perfect. Thank you, Alan. Okay, so let's let's transition to now. We're going to get back down to earth here. Talk about deals, and I, I'd love it if um, if each of you can kind of comment on um, kind of your first half of you know of uh, in review and and what the next half looks like. Kind of almost like kind of you know compare contrast. So you think in next you know the, the second half is going to be busier as busy. So give a sense of where your your because your pace was in the beginning of the, the first half of the year, and then. How does it look different or maybe it stays the same? Um, Michael, I'll start with you. Yeah, we've been quite fortunate. I mean, some of it's a carryover end of last year when the market got super frothy, as you know, and yep. that I just want to, you know, I, I think you said before in our pre-panel that you guys went up in transactions, I think from 200 to 500 over time. Yeah. You can comment on that, I think. But I think it was like that with a lot of professionals, like, you know, it was more than double. Yeah. And a lot of that was driven end of last year. So I think with some of that fatigue, we, we grabbed onto some processes that we closed in the last two months. We've deployed about 20% of our fund for about 160 million in the last six weeks. You know, just, you know, and, and, and uh, we feel very comfortable with those investments. Obviously, time will tell. But we've been very active, um, you know, in the market still, you know, with the volatility. Um, I don't know if values got in really better yet. I think in, in our marketplace in the small and in the middle market, the financings haven't been as affected, at least to date, as I think the large cap market. You know, we don't underwrite our deals to 100, 200 basis points of pricing. That's not our type of deal anyway. And the leverage market never, I don't think in the, you know, 
got as out of whack, you know, so, uh, and there's tons of dry powder out there for financing. Um, so I don't think, you know, in, in, and we're not paying double digit as much double digit multiples to begin with on, ac on the acquisition side. So mm -hmm. we've stayed, you know, disciplined. We found, you know, we're, we're underwriting end markets that you sensitize you. We always have been sensitizing recessions, even five years ago, because you never know what's going to happen. Uh, you're always going to be wrong. But, but now, obviously, it's front and center in every investment committee. So, you know, a pitch to Ellen, if you got a, a, a letter from us, you know, an IOI or LOI from us, you know, or any investment banker on the phone, you know, we've already sensitized it, you know, before submitting our IOI and LOI. And I think that's the strength of our, of our firm, you know, is, is um, coming with a reasonable value that we can close with. And um, that's what we've done lately. Got it. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Carrie, let's go back over to, to Stanford, Hamilton Robinson. First year, first half of the year, and then you're gonna be busier or we see deal flow coming in as the same pace or lower, higher. So, yeah, I mean, I would agree with everyone here. I think the entire m and ecosystem was sort of pedal to the metal through the end of 2021. Um, 2022, the beginning, we all had a little bit of a hangover. I think things did slow a bit. Um, we haven't seen a huge drop in deal flow, but definitely a, a little drop from, from the pace of 2021, which actually probably was welcomed by most of us. Um, but we, we have a pretty positive outlook for the remainder of the year. Um, you know, the one thing that we are definitely seeing on, on the private equity side um, that probably sort of cascades down to everyone else we're still seeing the high valuations, especially in the lower middle market. You know, we've never, so Hamilton Robinson's been around for 35 years. We've never really been asked to even get close to double digit multiples. And now on a regular basis, we are there and we're there on a regular, um, you know, in, in a very regular fashion on business services, on technical industrial products, on most of the things that we're looking at. Um, so we are really, um, more concentrated on diligence. And I think you'll, you'll see it on the investment banking side. Um, and I think that will slow things down a little bit as we get into the second half of 2022, where we're really taking our time and we really are using external resources like Plant Moran um, to, to help us diligence these companies because we know there are headwinds that are coming. We know that we need strong management teams that we can partner with to make sure that we're prepared for you know, as we all now face a myriad of things coming from different directions that we probably haven't even anticipated yet. So I think, um, you know, from the private equity side, our focus more on diligence will, will slow things down. So, you know, even for the investment bankers, if things are going slower than they typically would, I, I wouldn't necessarily think that that's a bad thing. It's just our way of saying, listen, you know, we, we play with other people's capital and we're very protective of it. Um, and so if it takes us a little while longer to make sure we're making the right decision and, and to Ellen's point, you know, really getting the right asset in the right way, in the right place, um, you know, you're going to sort of have to take us, you know, take everyone for that ride and make sure that, you know, again, at the end of the day, we're all pushing to help these small companies across the U.S. And if it helps them, it helps all of us. So uh, the partnership from all levels is, is definitely needed to get us through probably the next three to five years. Very interesting. I want Ellen to come back to that when I pass the time, but let me let me go to Justin first to finish the PE view. Um, so Justin, could you take us home on the PE side and then we'll go to Ellen. Then the next question, we'll start with Ellen first. Yeah, sure. So 2021 seemed to have start off uh, relatively slowly. And I think some of that was just the, the COVID impact in 2020 and people waiting for that to kind of roll out of the last 12 months of financials. And we just saw an explosion of opportunities in the second half of 2021. Uh, right or wrong, we were sort of agnostic as to that, um, you know, we can't control the market. All we can do is focus on, you know, where we can add value and, and what we do best. And it just turned out that in a 60 day period at the end of last year, we invested $650 million. So it was just a, a blockbuster uh, investing opportunity. 
and you know it took us a bit of the early part of this year to recover mm -hmm. uh, but there there really hasn't been it, it it seems to have been following the same pattern of last year where the first half is off to a little bit slower start we do have a sense that uh, things seem to be picking up for the second half of this year uh, but we're going to continue to pick our spots and, and look for situations where middle ground can deploy its capabilities and resources and and execute our value creation strategy um, we, we can't control kind of how people decide to, to bring their businesses to market, um, but obviously we can we can do our part to continue to meet with investment bankers and originate uh, and, and, and make sure we're, we're doing our part to keep the middle ground story out there and, and look forward to hopefully matching the success we had in the second half of last year. Alan, I'm hearing a lot of the same of we're open for business, man. We got the money to spend. So yeah, no, I know. Um, Love to hear it. God, Love just it. wonderful for the all investment bankers out there, right? Yeah. By demand. All right. So uh take the baton as you take where you'd like, but I do it would be interesting if you could comment on Carrie's point about um if you're seeing diligence process going longer. Yeah. I do agree. So um take it away. But if you could comment on that at some point, that'd be helpful. Yeah, yeah, no, no, for sure. Um, so yeah. Everything that everyone has said, I, I agree with. Started slow, definitely picking up. I, um, we are amazed every day um, at the volume of really good assets that continue to percolate, um, that want to go to market. Um, you know, I mean, that's driven by a bunch of things. You've got an aging demographic. You've got fatigue, both from COVID and supply chain and everything else issues. Um, but we are really. <laughs> kind of overwhelmed um, by activity and and we don't see that slowing down. Um, and I, I do agree with Carrie that, um, you know, processes do tend to be a little bit slower than what we had experienced in the past. Um, but, you know, we focus, and it's probably because plant is in our DNA, but, you know, we spend a lot of time up front with our clients and, you know, work to, make sure that we're putting forward, for example, a forecast that can withstand diligence, that we're doing the quality of earnings before we go to market and trying to identify any um, potential issues that could arise and, and determine how to best mitigate them. Um, one thing that I will say to my fellow panelists that um, I've experienced multiple times in my last um, few times out to um, with deals is how responsive the private equity sponsors have been, um, both in terms of, you know, kind of like an immediate yes, no. And even when somebody does take a book, um, you know, the, the response time has been very quick, just in terms of, you know what, this isn't a fit for us because, or yeah, we're going to go after this. Um, and yeah, I mean, processes are, are running longer. You know, we are starting to see, as we saw in the last quarter of 2022, or 2021, sorry, um, we're starting to see a little bit of a, a log jam on the diligence side. Um, and, and, you know, Ted, you and your brethren, um, you know, where, you know, it was tough to find people to do diligence and, and that definitely freed up, but we're starting to see that again, we're starting to see a little bit of that pressure. So um, that definitely speaks to, to volume of transactions right now. Too many European vacations for everyone. Yeah, or that. We're back to travel. <laughs> True. Uh, yes, it is. It, it, yeah, on the Dalton side, right? I mean, it definitely, you know, it's not, not just us, but certainly we've been in the middle of all that as well. Some of our competitors in the space, uh, the phone was ringing. <laughs> in 20, and, and so I guess I will just make a diligence comment in general. I mean, it, 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 it did slow a bit as, you know, because, like, yeah, the fourth quarter of 21 was absolutely berserk. Um, but, and there, it was, it, we, you know, we got a little bit of a rest there right in the beginning of what typically, you know, the classic, you know, little hangover there, but, um, and then now it's, it, it is, uh, it's a very steady clip, not, not quite to what, like the, uh, the pace was at this time last year, but it is, it's high. <laughs> so, um, again, the ecosystem is working. The engine is churning. Um, okay. Let's, um, let's shift a little bit. Let's go to, um. Uh, we want to talk about this notion of, um, you know, we talk about as in our prep calls, the notion of like just how much like the human capital side, again, it's a topic, we, we, every, how many panels you heard on this thing, but I, I think it, um, I, I think it was interesting. There's some really kind of cool things that 
were fairly tactical that I think our panelists were bringing up. So I thought we could, you could have some some commentary in that. And um, again, you know, the, the the real provocative term is, you know, is, is culture is king, is that the new cash is king. And of course, as very capitalistic folks, we, the answer is no, but it is just goes to show just how much, whether it's Michael or Ellen, you know, Camp CF for Carrie or Justin at their respective shops, trying to figure out within their portfolios and the, within their own firms, just how to get people right there. So um, with that, we know it's not a, a new issue. So maybe we'll start with Justin on this one, um, kind of share a little bit what you can with kind of what middle grounds approach to that. And, and I do think we all just felt past what I have, but I do think each each one of you have some, you know, some really kind of cool things that are, are real and they're happening. So Justin. Yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll separate it into two, um, how we think about human capital across our portfolio and how we think about human capital within middle ground. And there's a lot of overlap, uh, but, but they are different. So beginning with the portfolio, so middle ground, again, is a little bit different in the sense that uh, our, our managing partner got his start uh, on the plant floor, putting bumpers on a Toyota Camry. And so as the, the DNA of our firm is such that we understand what it's like to work in a plant. And we often put air conditioning and fans in our plants as soon as we own them. And we, and we build out recreation areas because we want people to want to come to work and have pride in their work. And, that, and that's part of our culture here. Uh, and we're also looking to bring in automation when there's a job that's very repetitive. Um, chances are you could probably replace that with automation. But the reality is we're, we're trying to replace a job that's not that interesting or not that much. It's not very rewarding. And so we, we want to free that person up to go do something more interesting in the plant. And if doing the same thing all day long, it, it's just not a, a great way to spend the day. Uh, we also um, have uh, implemented a number of initiatives around pay equity. And so um, back a couple of years ago, uh, we put a lot of pressure on our management teams to reduce as close to zero, if not zero, how many employees are making less than $20 an hour. And we've got it pretty close to zero now. And just recently we've launched our next initiative, which is we call 25 by 25, which is we're hoping now to, to really influence our portfolio companies to raise wages such that nobody makes less than $25 an hour by 2025. So that's something we, we take very seriously. Um, at middle ground, the firm, you know, it's 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 more the same where we want people to be excited to come to work and, and we want people to spend time with their coworkers outside of the office. And so our office in New York City is in lower Manhattan in Soho. I love coming here to work. And I think all the young people that work here love coming here to work and they live in this neighborhood and they and they walk to work. Uh, but we also take turns um, orchestrating sort of themed happy hours. We do a lot of activities together. We volunteer together. And to the extent we can build a culture and maintain a culture where people are excited to come to the office, enjoy spending time with each other when we're not working, I, I think we'll, we, we'll just work much better together. And, and so that's something we, we put a lot of time and energy in. Yep. No, I, I certainly know you guys well, and you, you guys certainly can demonstrate that. Um, so again, I, I thought that was interesting, kind of middle grounds approach. Um, you know, Carrie Hamilton Robinson has some of the uh, other approaches as well. I thought uh, would be interesting to the crowd to hear. Could share some of that. That'd be great. So human capital has really been the focus of all of our CEOs for for at least the past two years. We do a monthly CEO forum just to get them all together, get some camaraderie. So even on that level, they know they are not alone and they're supported by a greater organization, um, which during COVID was really invaluable. You know, just the, the ability to say, what are you seeing? I'm seeing this and, and share that knowledge real time was, uh, was a real culture builder on that level for our CEOs. Um, but even more than that, for, for Hamilton Robinson in general, um, building a strong culture has always been, you know, one of the top value creation tenants of our program. Um, we focus so much on sort of technical engineered products that, that replacing people in, in that, um, you know, sort of level is really difficult. Um, so retaining that top talent is always, you know, top of mind for us. Um, with this great resignation, you've seen the turnover of, of quite a lot of people. The problem has been not exactly the turnover, but the fact that the, the new people coming in, we are having to command a price much higher than we've ever seen before. 
So on many levels, you could have new people coming in that are then making uh, more money than people that have been there for, for several years. Um, and that to us is, you know, is an instant culture killer. Um, so we spent a lot of time thinking about how do we, how do we adjust this? How do we level set? Um, you know, and to Justin's point, how do we make this pay equity not a culture killer, but you know, a culture enhancer? So for most of our portfolio companies, we went to a, a skills-based um, compensation program, mm -hmm. which is really that what skills do you bring to this company? Not No longer how long have you been here? Um, and that was a monumental change for most of our companies. We buy, you know, we tend to buy more mature companies that have been around for a while. Um, and that was a huge hurdle to get over. Um, but if you think about it sort of in a Toyota lean efficiency kind of way, you know, it really does make the most sense. We are going to pay you the more skills you bring to us, the more you can bring to our bottom line, the more you can bring to value creation, the more valuable you are to us and the more we'll be willing to pay. So on our skills-based um, compensation plan, you then get uh, bonuses, you then get uh, increases in pay based on additional skills that you learn. Can you cross train? You know, that'll get you. And we were also very transparent, which is what we, we've always liked to do with not just our management teams, but with the company in general and all employees to be as transparent as possible. And this, this skills-based um, compensation program really has put control back to the employees. Mm -hmm. They know exactly where they need to be for their next pay raise. And I cannot tell you how surprised we have been, uh, sort of the overwhelming positive reaction that everybody has had to that. They're able to you know, level set themselves and, and decide, do I wanna go for that next pay raise or not? But they know what it will be and it's all been in their control. So for us, that has been a, a huge human capital plus that we've, uh, we've initiated. No, good stuff, Carrie. I mean, you guys are definitely just like middle ground putting kind of the, this, this real practical stuff in action that is different. I, so I, I appreciate both you guys sharing with that. Michael, big culture guy, I know you always have been. Uh, you've done some work with our uh, head of our firm on, on a plan a big culture firm. I'll say um, kind of like to a point like with Justin, you know, like the middle ground folks like like being around each other. I can test like tiering folks the same way, right? You guys just looks like you like to join working together. So um, strong culture as you have been since you started the firm. But more recently, kind of walk us through a couple of some of your bags of tricks, if you will, it's kind of Kerry and Justin have done it. Yeah, appreciate that, Ted. And it's been great to partner with firms like Plant Red, really, because we know when you're going into the companies, you understand that element of it, you know, that you're not dictatorial. You know, you got to build the trust of that team. You know, you're, you're the new party coming in, people are feeling secure, you know, and you have to learn first and listen. And, um, you know, so we appreciate that partnership. You've helped us a lot on, on many fronts, you know, where, where there's organizational development and we had to bring people on, on the interim and to help fix the problem. So appreciate that. But as a firm, we've always been big on culture, team play, you know, hiring team players with some grit, mm -hmm. you know, it, no arrogance, no politics, um, you know, which, which, is, which isn't so easy, especially as you continue to grow a firm, right? It's one thing when you're 10 people, it's another thing when you're 25 yeah. to 30 people. And then imagine within your portfolio companies, obviously you have hundreds of people, and so, you know, we question ourselves, how do you develop a highly effective culture? And with all the turmoil the last two years, it's really, if you don't have that highly effective culture, you're not gonna really reach your potential, right? So you can, we, we, what we've done the last two and a half years deliberately, we've hired a, a human talent officer, Hillary Dexter. Um, you know, actually she's bringing on a board someone to hopefully she'll start because you, you make people offers these days until they start. You don't know if they're going to actually come on board, mm -hmm. but, but we have uh, someone actually going to be, you know, a junior Hillary too coming on board in June. Cause it's, it's such an important part of what we do. We, we probably recruit 30 executives a year, but as important to that, almost every company now we have an independent board director, you know, to bring some independence and, and to have some, another set of eyes on, on culture and how to communicate private equity to CEOs or founders and vice versa. And then also we do organizational development reviews and we have third parties to help do those reviews. 
And it shouldn't be intimidating. It's really, you get a, a general sense of the corporate health, like at the labor level of a company and what they're asking for. And if they're getting the right level, level of leadership, you know, so it's kind of a 360. And then, and then you do interviews with the top 10 to 20 people, you know, one-on-ones with the organizational development company. And you really learn a lot on succession planning on, I think as um, Carrie, you pointed out the skill base, you know, some people want a certain level of intensity on their job and some don't, right? So you learn what's going to fit them best. And they might not be as, they might be more open actually with a third party than with you directly, if they're not going to talk to you directly. That's another thing we've done. We've also done more standardized CO reviews uh, annually, which we're going to have now every six months, right? Just to make sure that feedback loop between private equity and the CO is there. So I think those are some elements that, that we've added to our, our uh, toolkit to be less ad hoc on culture. I love it. I mean, you, so common threads I just heard, right? You, you have transparency, more communication, uh, equity came up throughout all three of you guys. So um, these are real things. That's why I like the, you know, I, I'm always like hesitant to bring up the, you know, the war on human talent because it's such a tired topic. But the fact that, you know, we, as we talked about the pre calls, I think you guys had some really good things there. So, Ellen, take us home here. I know I didn't give you the first this question first, which I, sorry about that. <laughs> but um, you can go through from, you know, PMCF is a you know, great boutique investment bank with 30 folks, but you can take it there. Would you have going to PMCF or just kind of from a seller's perspective? what you're seeing that could be interesting because I know you, you've seen a lot in your day. So, yeah, um, I mean, I, yeah, I think I can, I can speak to both sides. I mean, certainly as PMC app, you know, culture is very important. We, we very much um, embrace plants culture and, and are, you know, very much the beneficiaries of what plant started. Um, and so, you know, I think like many people, we, we struggle a bit with, you know, maintaining that culture, keeping that culture when people are working somewhat remotely, trying to get everybody back in the office. Um, you know, we've got a big team building event coming up to, to get everyone together physically um, for the first time in a long time. Um, and so, you know, that that's really important. We're, we're, all, we're all fighting for talent, um, fighting to retain talent. Um, on, on the M&A side, you know, certainly strong management teams have always been important, especially when selling to private equity. Um, and so, you know, it's just become that much more critical. Um, and so from our perspective, um, making sure that we're, we are hitting those points, as Carrie said, you know, pointing out their creativity, their flexibility, their agility, um, and their operating acumen, and then supporting the management team in, in the diligence process and making sure they're prepared so that they are putting themselves in the best light and that they are prepared. I, I think one thing that I have noticed as of late is that um, more and more sellers are paying attention to employee retention um, throughout the m and process that used to kind of be a, a topic that they would kind of push off or, or wouldn't really see as valuable. Um, and now uh, more and more sellers, shareholders are thinking about how am I going to make sure that these valuable assets, these people who are driving this business and creating this value in my business are going to stay post-transaction so that I can maximize my value on the exit and keep that culture moving forward. So, and, and, and Ellen, to that point, like, does that mean that just more sellers are bringing not just three to five, the top three to five people under the tent? Is it just, does that mean just bringing a few, you know, a few more, you, you, is that kind of what it get like, what's, what's your, some of the, what's what a little bit more, add just one more comment if you could on that. Yeah, it's, it is. It's broadening. It's broadening the circle, kind of the circle of trust, bringing mm -hmm. more people in and, and making them feel empowered in the process rather mm -hmm. than, you know, notifying them at the 11th hour that they now are going to be yep. reporting to somebody else. Um, and then, yeah, and then I think it's it's kind of expanding the pool, even those who aren't involved in the process itself, um, the pool of people who are going to get a retention bonus around a transaction um, to kind of alleviate some of the anxiety around a transaction once it's been announced both sides of it got it no th thanks for that um well good well guys i think that was that was uh hopefully uh some value add points for for the audience uh thanks thanks to all we, we haven't had a lot of people drop off so that's usually a good sign <laughs> let's uh let's kind of wrap this up with some some q a uh, we had a few questions that come in uh first one uh, it's probably for Ellen. It's like, 
what um, in terms of uh, sellers, so try to read this in real quick. Sellers driving value during, well, like what drives value during like the sale process that can really make things um, more, more enticing to the seller on the exit price? Well, there's some things that are really, hit the words hot, you know, but like what are some things that are really driving deal value right now? I think is the stem of the question. Yeah, so I, I, I think it's, it's a couple of things. It's being prepared. Um, being prepared for the process, um, making sure that you've got the right advisors. Uh, you know, so often we'll have clients who will say, you know, I've been working with John Doe for forever. He's my corporate guy, my attorney. And, and you know, it's a sensitive conversation, but it's an important one. You, you need to make sure that you've got the right M&A advisor. It's, it's a different, um, and your guy doesn't have to be displaced, but you need to make sure that your team is shored up. Um, you know, data is, is super important. Um, you know, not just saying this is what we do, but being able to substantiate it with data. Um, you know, that, and that goes back to Carrie's point that, you know, there's more and more diligence being done. And so um, everything that we say needs to be supported um, and needs to be able to withstand the diligence. Um, yeah, and then I, I you know, <laughs> pre-sale diligence, you know, making sure that, you know, we are doing the quality of earnings and that, um, you know, we're ready. And, you know, I just, I was with a client the other day and they were going through their five month performance and they had exceeded um, the budget. And I said, you know, nothing is better for a process than um, yeah. exceeding expectations. Um, you know, once you miss a forecast, once you miss a month, you start to lose credibility and and nothing will deplete value like that. So yeah, thank, thank you, On. All right, time for a couple more here. Um, let's see, are there functions, are there features of your program around doubling down on your uh, on how to prepare your, your next acquisition for future headwinds? So uh Kira, you wanna start start us off on this one? More you know, and control. maybe I'll I'll piggyback on what you and Ellen just sort of stressed that bringing more people under the tent. One of the things that Hamilton Robinson's been doing for for thirty plus years um, that we don't really, I'm not sure you really get the the full breadth of of how important it is during the good times. Um, but when we have these macro downturns, the fact that we give very broad equity ownership, not just to the management team but we'll go all the way down to, you know, the employees. Um, you know, it's really something that even if you're the seller or even if you're the, the intermediary, you know, something to push for and something to think about. Because what we have found through, you know, multiple, multiple cycles and multiple downturns is that when you have everybody in that company thinking and acting like an owner, as opposed to an employee, it is a drastically different outcome, especially when you're going through the downturns. In the good times, it's kind of a nice to have, but in the downturns, that's where that really plays out and you get that huge push in value creation. And we've seen it over and over again um, as you come out of some of these recessions or downturns that the, the effort that was put in during those downturns really pays off in spades as you come out of it. So that is, that is one... Um, aspect that I think everybody should really think about and uh, and try to incorporate in, in whatever piece of the process you're uh, you're working on. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, just got one last question came in, but uh, any any rebuttals or thoughts to Carrie's points there? Okay. Um, this one's probably meant for, I'm assuming towards, towards Alan, but it's, it's kind of a general question, but a very good one. What are common themes you're hearing from sellers and you talked about it being very busy right now. We know it's busy for your other brother running the investment banking world. What are some common themes you're hearing from sellers now as you uh, kind of look into the second half? Prep yeah, I think a lot of people ask um, two things. Are we too late? Um, mm -hmm. You know, is it too late to, to even think about starting a process? And, um, you know, what's happening with values, um, you know, for those who are in, in market? Um, I would say that those are the the two biggest questions, and um, you know, I I think Carrie mentioned this earlier. You know, we're not really seeing the valuation pressure yet. 
Um, and I, you know, I think that that is because we've been a little bit shielded on the debt side and there is a lot of competition um, on the buy side. So, um, you know, our answer is don't, don't worry about it yet. And yes, you should still be going to market, but um, you know, tomorrow can change that. But for right now, it's still a strong market for sure. And so, so why don't we leave it there, right? I think, um, you know, again, lots of noise, how we started this panel, but I think Alan kind of summed up the best that there's still, this, again, that ecosystem, the engine, the demand that's coming from both sides, the ability to, to fund these deals and get the, the, the financing in place to do it is still there. Maybe it's some different twists and turns you got to take there on the execution side, but um, I think uh, overall this panel is trying to convey our, our pretty positive outlook, I think, for the next, next six months. So with that, um, I think uh, to, to our Opus folks, Lena, I think it can kind of close where we're at. I know we're a couple minutes early. No one typically yells at us if we finish the panel early. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Ted, for leading uh, that discussion and to our panelists for your participation. Um, we hope that you as audience members found value in today's discussion. We will be posting this to our YouTube in the next 24 to 48 hours. So look out for that video if you need to revisit any points that were discussed uh, in today's panel. But again, thank you to all of you for participating, um, to our panelists for your willingness to share, to our sponsors for your continued support, and to all of you for joining in. If you are participating in our Deal Connect meetings after this, you're going to want to sign out of this link and log in to the separate link that uh, my colleagues circulated yesterday. Uh, once again, we want to thank you all for your participation, and we look forward to hopefully seeing everyone in person soon. We'll see about that. But until then, stay healthy and uh, take care. Thank Great. you all. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Thanks, Ted. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.